And every time that we would bring up the witnesses, the fact that there was no firsthand witnesses that actually said the president did anything wrong, just read the transcript. There's nothing wrong here. I'm not going to vote to approve witnesses because the House Democrats have had lots of witnesses. Given the House Democrats' presentation, there are now real questions about Joe Biden and Hunter Biden's conduct. But questions. you would need to vote to approve witnesses to hear well, from the Bidens, which you just said well, you're not I'd going like, to do. I'd like to hear what Adam Schiff has to say about those facts that he again glossed over. It is the head-scratching case the president and his defenders continue to make. There's not enough evidence for impeachment, there are no first-hand witnesses, and there are real questions after the House impeachment managers gave their opening arguments. Except senators already had and still have the opportunity to hear evidence. They had an opportunity to hear testimony from those witnesses. But in a party-line vote, Republicans killed every Democratic amendment to do so. And when asked if they'll vote in favor of hearing that evidence or having those witnesses, some of those same Republicans say, nope, nope, they'll vote against that too. Joining me now, Charlie Pierce, writer at large at Esquire, Kimberly Atkins, senior Washington news correspondent for WBUR and an MSNBC contributor and civil trial and criminal defense attorney, Midwin Charles. Charlie, you were in, the, in those gaggles talking to these senators. How do they try to make sense of it just being confronted as they walk out of the hearings, hearing, sitting in a trial and saying, nope, we don't need any witnesses except unless we can make it be Adam Schiff and the whistleblower and, and Biden? Well, uh, the Republicans are all fish flopping around in the bottom of the boat, basically. <laughs> They're just, they are just—they have the votes. They know they have the votes. They're just hanging on, and they don't necessarily have to make a lot of sense. Yeah. I mean, I think the, 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 the epic moment in regards to that was the other night after Adam Schiff's presentation when they all pretended to be offended by the fact that he quoted the CBS report about heads on pikes. I mean, James Lankford of Oklahoma practically bowled people over getting the microphone to explain how he wasn't afraid. Uh, they're terrified, by the way. They're all terrified. Sherrod Brown, Sherrod Brown said that the other night, and he's absolutely right. And I think he made a good comparison. He compared it to the mood in the chamber when they were voting on the Iraq war. Mm -hmm. And all the Democrats were afraid to vote against it. Yeah. And guess what? All the people who voted, who voted for the war yeah. and ran for president, they all lost. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Let, let's play uh, Senator Mike Braun of Indiana this morning on Meet the Press. Uh, talking about the, the point of, you know, the idea, the, the thing that's important about this is that this is about the next election uh, and whether or not Donald Trump will be constrained from trying to get foreign help to win again, um, like he did last, uh, like he accepted last time. Here's Mike Braun talking about that. This president, as you know, he's going to take acquittal and think, I can keep doing this. No, I don't think that. Uh, hopefully it'll be instructive to where... When, you say when, hopefully. I mean, well, what's the evidence in his lifetime that he takes a any sort of whatever it is, a misdemeanor ticket or whatever, and then he accepts that and goes, yeah, well, I'll change my behavior. I think he'll put two and two together. In this case, he was taken to the carpet. Does that seem credible to you, Kimberly? No, I mean, for another for a number of reasons. Remember that the call, the, the so-called perfect call, as the president describes it, took place one day, one day after Robert Mueller testified before Congress and essentially brought to an end the Mueller investigation. So if that didn't stop uh, the president from engaging in this type of behavior, which was the same type oh, that was the subject of the Mueller investigation, certainly this wouldn't. And it's, it belies the fact that Republicans could be making an argument that that even though this was awful, uh, terrible behavior by the president, he should not have enlisted foreign help in an election, that perhaps it doesn't rise to the level of impeachment they wish he hadn't do it. They can't even do that because of the White House, to the previous point about being afraid. The White House had shot down any sort of uh, acceptance of that kind of defense. They can only say that the call was perfect, that nothing was wrong, and that the Democrats are essentially making up the brief for the president's attorney says that the that the uh, Democrats are making up the charge of obstruct of <laughs> abuse of power that that didn't exist before and they made it up and so this is what Republicans are forced to come forward and defend but so far they have stuck together and are doing that very thing and the thing that's so crazy is some of the people who are arguing there's no such thing as abuse of power voted specifically because they believed that Bill Clinton abused his power by lying about a sexual affair with the White House intern that's specifically what they thought that he he did but they think it doesn't exist anymore. Um, let's, let's look at this tweet this morning. We've talked about it several times, but I mean, this is the last time we're going to show it. I'm sorry to the audience who's having to be subjected to it again. I'm not going to read it, but this is Donald Trump using weird uh, expletives about Adam Schiff and saying he's, um, you know, hasn't paid the price, blah, 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 sort of mafioso language. Here's Adam Schiff responding to the vindictiveness of this president on Meet the Press. 
I made the argument that it's going to require moral courage to stand up to this president. Um, and this is a wrathful and vindictive president. I don't think there's any doubt about it. And if you think there is, look at the president's tweets about me today, uh, saying that I should pay a price. Um, you take that as a threat? I think it's intended to be. You know, Republicans I've talked to that are sort of in the orbit uh, of Trump world have, have said the same thing, that this is a vindictive man, that he's, 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 revenge is sort of what drives him, that that's what drives him. His biographers have said it, too. You know, we talk about recidivism. You know, that's what sort of the previous question was about. If you, you know, if you have a client that is acquitted but is of the mind to go back and do it again, Trump feels like that kind of a client for his That's right. He, he's what we call a repeat offender. He's a repeat offender. And if you even go back before he became president and you look at his professional life with how he managed his businesses, with how he managed any one of his professional endeavors, Trump University, the charity, every single one of those things had some element of fraud. Uh, we've had, um, uh, you know, the attorney general, he's, you know, everybody has stepped in to kind of try to rein him in. Right. And yet the behavior continues each and every opportunity, each and every chance he gets, every single opportunity he gets. Yeah. It's the same exact type of behavior where uh, he skirts the rules. He doesn't follow, you know, protocol and procedure. Mm -hmm. and, and those kinds of things don't seem to matter to him and you can tell by the way in which he conducts himself as president yeah you know uh, the separation of powers does not matter to him he does not seem to even acknowledge and want to acknowledge you know Congress's oversight powers with respect to when them asking for documents and witnesses this is someone who thumbs his nose at authority this is someone who doesn't believe he should ever be held accountable and we saw that before he became president and I keep saying that because back in 2015 and 2016 when a whole bunch of us were like this guy is yeah. not the guy to be president. People thought we were crazy. They yeah. said there would be grown-ups in the room. They yeah. said that there would be guardrails. They said that Congress would check him. But guess what? We know now that Congress is unable to check him. At least the Republicans are in the yeah. Senate. Yeah, absolutely. And the problem here is that the recidivism would mean again, having interference, foreign interference to help him get elected again. But the, um, the Mueller report makes that clear. Yeah, absolutely. The Mueller report outlined that, you know, that he helped in, yeah. in some ways with Russian interference. At, you well, know. he at least accepted it. He, he accepted happily it. accepted it. He but accepted it. Before we go, National Review uh, editorial board, who's been all over the place on Trump, they've been for Trump, they've been against Trump, they have now uh, come out with an editorial from the editorial board saying impeachment does not require a crime. Quote, Republicans from the president on down are making arguments that range from the implausible to the embarrassing, hence the claim now being advanced half-heartedly by Republicans that presidents cannot be impeached for any abuse of power unless that ab abuse took the form of a criminal violation of a statute. Jonathan Turley has repudiated this view. Attorney General William Barr has in the past denied it. The founding era debates about impeachment are clear that Congress was to be able to remove a president from office if he had exercised his legal powers in an abusive way. Uh, very quickly, do you agree with that, uh, Attorney Midwin Charles? I do. Yeah. I do. Uh, Absolutely. It's, it's abundantly clear that we ought to be able to remove a president who yeah. abuses power. What would be the purpose of the impeachment clause if we couldn't? It, it would have no You meaning. would basically nullify the impeachment clause if yeah. you couldn't do this. And Kimberly Atkins happens to be a lawyer, too. I think, <laughs> I think. I call lots of people lawyers. Are you a lawyer, too, Kimberly? Do you agree with that? I do. I do. The, the framers specifically made it not contingent upon a statutory crime. That was, the, that was the purpose of it, and that's the way that it should be interpreted. I was finally right that somebody I think is a lawyer is actually is a lawyer. Charlie, very quickly before we go, isn't the concern here that Trump will do it again, and then that means our next election is just actually not safe? Well, even, you know, even if he doesn't do it again, and I think he will, mm -hmm. the seed has been planted right. to yeah. doubt the result of the next election one way or the other. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know that, he, that, that, that if he loses, he'll jump all over it. Yeah, absolutely. Charlie, Kimberly, and Midwin. Okay, stick around, because up next, these three lovely people are going to tell us who won the week.